Good morning, I'm Lynn. And I'm Vivian. And here's the society news for Friday the 1st of March 2019. There will be a coffee morning held in support of the society on Tuesday the 5th of March at the post office in Knighton. All are welcome from half past 10 until 12 o'clock. The swimming group are swimming at the waterside pool in Ryde. The pool is closed to the public whilst the group swims. There are male and female volunteers to help you get in and out of the pool, as well as lifeguards to ensure your safety. To join the swimming group, please call the Site for White first to notify us of your swimming ability. You need to register with the office at Millbrook House first to be able to swim with the group. Wednesday the 6th of March. The weekly coffee morning will be held at Millbrook House this week from 10.30am. There will also be our low visual vision drop-in between 10 and 12 noon a weekly event to allow you to view and try the low vision equipment we have at the Society without the need for an appointment. The Wednesday social group are meeting at Millbrook House when our favourite zookeeper, Gary Harbour, will be returning along with a few friends at 2pm. If you would like to come along and listen to Gary's talk, then please let Laura know on 522205. Admission is just £3 and includes tea, coffee and cake. The talk lasts approximately one hour. For more information, visit our website www.iwsb.org.uk Thursday the 7th of March. The Thursday Social Group are meeting at Millbrook House. The group meets from 10.30am till 2pm. You can knit or just have a chat. Then later in the afternoon, volunteers come in and read to the group from different topics. Any other news? The AGM, 26th of February. Papers are now available to view on our website, www.iwsb.org.uk. The Freshwater Book Group will be meeting next Tuesday, the 5th of March at 11 o'clock at Freshwater Library. This is a week later than usual, but they will be pleased to see all members current and new. Sight Loss Awareness Event. Laura Kuljar, Eye Clinic Liaison Officer at St Mary's Hospital, will be hosting a Sight Loss Awareness Event on Saturday the 23rd of March, 10am to 4pm at the Riverside Centre. Entry is free and refreshments can be purchased. Confirmed attendees at the time of writing are Sight for White, Guide Dogs, Macular Society, International Glaucoma Association, Retina UK, Orcam, RNIB, NHS Falls Team and information from Esme's Umbrella and the Nystagmus Network. Chris Kane was a guest on Sunshine Radio on Tuesday the 5th of February and listeners can hear the interview later in the programme. Following inquiries from our members about the pedestrian crossing near Morrison's and Marks and Spencer's, this is the response from the island, Island Roads. The newly upgraded traffic signals at Morrison's and MSS entrance has been designed to current standards for Island Roads. The pedestrian crossings do now not have audible tones on them as the designer has arranged the layout of the crossings and traffic flows such that they could be changed to allow different timings to be set, which would mean that there could be traffic moving over parts of the junction while pedestrians could be crossing on others. To ensure safety and that no one would step out into the road when hearing an audible tone sound, only tactile cones are fitted to the push-button units. All of the crossing approaches except one on the Lytton Park side by the park path also have push-button demand units on both sides of the tactile paving at the crossings for additional access to the demand buttons and tactile cones. 
If you are unable to read or hold a telephone directory because of your sight loss or other disability, you can make use of a free directory enquiries service. You can use this service whether or not BT is your telephone company. Once you have successfully signed up to the service, all you do is dial 195 and you can speak to an operator who will find the number you require. If you ask to be connected to the number you require, you will then be charged for the call you make according to the call package that you have with your provider. For more details, please call free on 0800-587-0195. Site for White Activities. A new piece of equipment that is now available is the In Your Pocket portable media device and smartphone. It is the simplest way for blind and partially sighted people to access the RNIB library and RNIB newsagent services, as well as make phone calls. In Your Pocket is a voice-controlled phone, streaming media player and vision assistant, designed specifically for people who are blind or who have low vision. Sight for White has arranged to have a demo version and will have it available to try at the Low Vision Drop-In and Coffee Morning on Wednesday the 20th of March, 10 till 12 noon. Five-day holiday to Llandudno. This will be at the Somerset Hotel, which enjoys an enviable seafront promenade location in the heart of Llandudno. The outward journey date is Wednesday the 16th of October, returning on Sunday the 20th of October. The cost is from £440 per person and includes local pickup, coach travel, ferry fare, single room accommodation, breakfast, dinner, evening entertainment, sight for white sighted guides and insurance via Daisy's Holidays. Please note, all activities are subject to demand and availability of volunteers for supporting sighted escort guides. Closing date for expressions of interest is Monday the 11th of March. Please contact Laura for more details. Email members at iwsb.org.uk or call on 01983 522205. This week's In Touch, a new way of booking assistance on trains. A train company turns to a voice assistant to try to make the experience more seamless for visually impaired passengers who are booking assistance. Show more, Virgin Trains offers customers a new way of booking assistance during travel on its routes. It has developed a skill for Amazon Alexa enabled devices. Emma Tracy tries it out for us and Vic Whitehouse from Virgin Trains explains why they've developed it. Hester, an 11-year-old visually impaired student from Bath, is going on a fundraising journey to Ethiopia. She'll be visiting other visually impaired school children and doing a five-kilometre run to raise money for the school. Hester says she's nervous but looking forward to the experience. Mike Lambert believes more resources and effort should be put into inclusion for visually impaired people. Liz Smith, a Conservative in the Scottish Parliament, put forward a motion questioning the current presumption of mainstreaming for visually impaired students. He explains his personal reasons for why he is sure inclusion should work. The presenter will be Peter White and the producer will be Lee Kumatat. Now we come to the County Press headlines for Friday, March the 1st. Huge jobs boost at fashion firm. Eco-clothing company Rapanu has announced it will create 100 new jobs at its freshwater factory as it looks to revolutionise the fashion industry. The company has secured a six-figure loan to buy the car park next to its renewable, energy-powered factory at Hook Hill and expand its production facility with a two-storey factory and office extension, giving 12,000 square foot on each floor. 
Over the next two years, the company will expand its solar farm and create 100 new jobs, bringing its total workforce to 175 people. Rapanai runs an online platform, T-Mill Tech, enabling customers to design their own t-shirts and other products. They can then use Rapanai's supply chains and production facilities to create their own clothing brands. Rapanai co-founder Rob Drake Knight said people can do in 10 minutes on their phone what it's taken us 10 years to do at Rapunai. It's not just t-shirts, it's anything. Anyone can start their own brand. They don't need any investment or premises or stock. T-Mail technology enables people to participate in the fashion company who want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. The idea is to make T-Mail the Uber and Airbub of the fashion industry. Rapunai has come a long way since it was founded a decade ago by Rob brothers Rob, 34, and Mark Drake Knight, 33. They started the business from their parents' garden shed in Lake and have become one of the island's greatest success stories, creating truly sustainable fashion right here on the Isle of Wight. Clothes are made using plastic-free circular production methods from organic materials designed to be returned, exchanged for store credit and remade. Supermodel Kate Moss and comedian Russell Howard have been pictured wearing T-Mail Tech t-shirts. The loan was provided by Lloyds Bank Commercial Banking through its Clean Growth Financial Initiative. Over the next three years, the company's manufacturing capacity will increase from more than 50,000 t-shirts a month to around 500,000. The expansion will create new job opportunities, particularly for young people in the West White. Rob said, all of our apprentices have gone on to full-time jobs. It's a team of people who want to do things differently and make things better. A man with knives tasered by police. Police tasered and arrested a man who was seen carrying knives and damaging a fire engine in Ride on Wednesday night. Officers were called to an address at Melville Street shortly before nine o'clock where a woman was also arrested on suspicion of assaulting a police officer. Fire crews had been called to the scene following reports of a fire in a basement flat. When they arrived, however, the fire had already been extinguished. An Isle of Wight police spokesperson said, We were called to Melville Street after a report of a man carrying knives damaging a fire engine. Officers located a 34-year-old man from Ride who was arrested on suspicion of causing criminal damage and a fray. We can confirm a taser was discharged in order to detain the man safely at the scene. A 50-year-old woman from Ride was also arrested on suspicion of two offences of assaulting a police officer. Both remained in police custody yesterday, Thursday. Isle of Wight women in business. Are you a woman leading an organisation or running your own business? A survey is trying to establish numbers of Isle of Wight women who are leading businesses or organisations or running their own. The survey is being hosted by solicitor Alison Colley. To take part, go to tinyurl.com forward slash W I W E P W D E. Alison and her colleagues are hosting an open house drop in session at their offices at 24 Carisbrook Road, Newport, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. next Friday, March the 8th. Drop in for coffee and cake. Meet other women and men who support the International Women's Day theme of Balance for Better. If you provide services or support, for women on the island, then feel free to drop by with resources and information that can be shared. The event is free to attend, although donations are welcome on the day for White Dash, the island's domestic abuse support hub. A new home for circus lions on the Isle of Wight. Two circus lions will arrive on the Isle of Wight from mainland Europe today, Friday, 
having beaten any potential post-Brexit customs changes. Vigo and Kumba will arrive at their new home, the Isle of Wight Zoo, after a 1,300-mile journey by road, Eurotunnel and ferry to reach their final place of sanctuary. The two lions have spent their lives so far in small compartments on a lorry, let out only when forced to perform. Following their rescue and subsequent rehabilitation at a special centre in Spain, the Wild Heart Trust, which operates the Isle of Wight Zoo, has launched a fundraising campaign to bring forward urgent arrangements to import the lions ahead of Brexit. The zoo feared delaying the move would not only have meant the lions spending longer at the temporary rescue centre, but port of entry changes would add further time and travel distance to what is already a tricky journey for the big cats. While the fundraising target has not yet been reached, the Trust was compelled to act in the interests of the lions, using the public's donations to date to make enclosure changes, which will provide good accommodation until enough is raised to build a more permanent solution. Garden villages could be created. Another 1,700 homes could be built in completely new Isle of Wight villages, in addition to the 10,000 proposed in the island plan. The draft island plan sets out proposals for 9,676 new homes over the next 15 years, most of which would be built on greenfield sites and mainly around existing settlements. However, it also includes the potential for 2,000 homes in new garden community villages, 1,700 of which would be on top of the 9,676 total. Two sites have been highlighted as potentially accommodating these new villages, one near Wellow and the other near God's Hill. However, they could all be built on one site, creating a substantial new village comparable to the size of Bembridge. Last week, the Isle of Wight campaign to protect rural England raised fears that proposed new homes would destroy acres of countryside and urbanise large tracts of rural Isle of Wight. This week, Island MP Bob Seeley said the house-building target for the island should be slashed and the Isle of Wight should be treated as a special case. The draft island plan said the new garden communities should be vibrant, healthy and sustainable and set out principles planners should follow. It said the new settlements should be holistically planned, delivering around 2,000 new dwellings in a mix of tenure, sizes and types. It said the developments should enhance the natural environment and provide strong cultural, recreational and shopping facilities at an appropriate scale in a walkable, vibrant, sociable community, offering integrated transport systems favouring environmentally friendly travel and avoiding protected areas, flood zones and quality agricultural land. A council spokesman said the garden community pre- community proposals were in response to comments from residents saying they did not, did not want more housing development on the edge of existing settlements. The MP build homes for islanders. Mr Bob MP Bob Seeley has plan has slammed plans to build thousands of homes on the Isle of Wight and urged the council to axe proposals for new villages. Last week, Mr Seeley said the island should be exempt from the government's 10,000 homes target and called on council leader, Councillor Dave Stewart, to join him in appealing to ministers. He said the target should be slashed from 640 homes to 200 to 250 homes a year, which should be built for islanders. Responding to the Isle of Wight Council's island plan consultation, which closed on Monday, Mr Seeley said he welcomed some elements of it, including farm diversification, town centre shopping areas, improved connectivity between Island Line and the steam railway, and conserving the historic environment, but nevertheless could not support it. He said housing was not being built for island people, 
but for the broader South East England housing market. We allow the building of three and four bedroom houses when demand from islanders is for one and two bedroom properties. As a result, our young people are unable to find or afford the right housing and are forced off the island, he said. If the council accepted targets it could not fulfil, Mr Seeley warned it would leave itself open to developers cherry-picking greenfield sites and forcing through inappropriate developments. He asked the council to rule out the creation of large-scale new village sites, with the exception of the Camp Hill site. Cuts and council tax hike approved. A council tax increase of almost 3% and 5.5 million in cuts were voted through on Wednesday by the Isle of Wight Council. Councillors approved next year's budget proposals by a vote of 25 in favour to 14 against. Two alternative budgets put forward by the Liberal Democrats and independent Labour councillor Jeff Brodie were voted down. The Ireland Independents, the largest opposition group, did not put forward an alternative budget. Proposed savings include a review of all care packages, increased crematorium charges, a reduction in the home to school bus contract and a review and reorganisation of the disabled children's intervention team. Meanwhile, reserves will grow to 12.2 million. Council bosses said this amount, almost double the minimum, minimum required, would provide resilience. Cabinet Member for Finance, Councillor Stuart Hutchinson, said, Without that resilience and capacity, we would be driven to more reductions in services or ceasing some services altogether. Councillor Leader, Councillor Dave Stewart, said the key focus for the year would be housing and infrastructure, as well as investment in schools, adult social care and regeneration. Councillor Paul Brading said the savings from the Disabled Children's Intervention Team would be taken at a managerial level with the removal of two vacant posts. One further manager would be deployed elsewhere in the service. Labour councillor Julia Baker-Smith said she did not buy into the theatre of the alternative budget and so had not submitted her own. Heroic bus driver wins top award. A bus driver who saved a customer's life by performing CPR has been named Employee of the Year by Southern Vectis. Ali Valiani transferred to the Isle of Wight from Southern Vectis sister company Go Ahead London. It was not long before he became a great asset to the team, praised for his enthusiasm and superb customer service skills. He was presented with his award by Managing Director Andrew Wickham at the company's annual ceremony. Mr Wickham said, We regularly receive compliments for Ali, telling us he consistently goes the extra mile. One specific example of this is when a customer collapsed on his bus. Ali made the brave decision to perform CPR while awaiting paramedics and we learned that our passenger may well not have survived were it not for Ali's heroic actions. In recognition of his efforts, Ali received £500 worth of vouchers and a framed certificate. 5 to 7 High Street taken off market. The bungled sale of 5 to 7 High Street in Benbridge has taken another turn, with the parish council taking the building off the market. The controversial sale saw the council tied up in a judicial review, launched by local business owner Peter Burke, who had submitted the highest cash offer for the building, but had his offer rejected. Relaunching launching the sale, a closed bid was held and Mr Burke's bid was accepted as highest, but then the council called another meeting as Nick Challen, the competing bidder, increased his offer. However, since then, the council has taken the building off the market. A spokesman for the parish council said, Benbridge Parish Council has found itself in an untenable position due to the threat of ongoing legal challenges. Therefore, we have agreed to reject the increased offer for 5 to 7 High Street and remove 5 to 7 High Street from the market pro tem. 
Shopper Ruby 103 is a real gem. Meet Ruby, who, at 103 years old, is Sainsbury's most loyal customer. She is a regular shopper at the Newport store and has been given her own shelf selection called Ruby's Favourites, where customers can choose from Ruby's top pick of products. Ruby and her family were invited into store for the day so she could inspect the products herself and persuade other customers to try them. She was given the full royal treatment, receiving flowers and a tea party in the cafe, plus a big cake. Six of Ruby's family members, spanning three generations, accompanied her for the extra special shopping trip. Charlie Bird, store manager, said, It's always lovely to see Ruby in store. She's got such a passion for life and our colleagues love going the extra mile to support her whenever she needs. Homes plan to be approved. Plans for 66 homes in Northwood have been recommended for approval by Isle of Wight Council officers, despite objections from residents. The planning application for the development submitted, submitted by Harding Holdings is due to go before the Council's planning committee on Tuesday. It includes a mixture of bungalows, flats and two three and four bedroom houses, plus 131 parking spaces off Newport Road. More than 100 letters of objection have been submitted, largely by residents who say the green space, a natural boundary between Northwood and Newport, should be protected. They have raised concerns about access to and from an already busy road, the impact on wildlife, a lack of infrastructure to support new homes, including doctors, dentists and school places, and said the design of the development was out of character with the surrounding area. They have also criticised a lack of affordable housing included in the plans, and said young people would not be able to afford a home there. Cowes Town Council and Northwood Parish Council have objected to the application. Objectors have questioned the need for further housing in the area, following approval for developments at Place Road, 93 homes, Medina Yard, 535 units, and the former reservoir site, 146 units. Planning officers who have recommended approval for outline permission said the application site was in a key regeneration area and the development would accord with planning policy. A ring and bracelet among unearthed treasure. A hall of treasure, including a medieval gold ring and Bronze Age bracelet, has been unearthed by detectorists. Four treasure inquests were held at the Isle of Wight Coroner's Court last Thursday following the fines over the past year. The bracelet fragment, dating back to 1150 to 800 BC, was found near Calborn and the 15th century ring, inscribed with an image of St Margaret spearing a dragon and the phrase, graciously accept, was discovered at Godshill. British Museum expert Frank Basford said such rings were a popular choice for betrothal or wedding gifts. A variation on the inscription, Prenez en Gré, which translates as accept with gratitude, was taken from a poem by the French poet Christine de Pizan. Detectorists also found a fragment of an Anglo-Saxon gilded silver square-headed brooch from 450 to 600 AD in Bryston. It features a stylized animal mask with bulbous eyes and in the upper left corner the remains of stylized animal limbs. A gold coin pendant depicting the Roman Emperor Valentinian I, 364 to 375 AD, was found near Sandown. Mr. Basford said, It's very interesting because the pendant loop is Anglo Saxon. It's possible the coin is a contemporary copy and dates to the early Anglo Saxon period. All the items were declared to be treasure and have already caught the eye of museums wishing to acquire them. The pieces will now be valued by an independent committee. Hotels' huge revamp a step nearer. 
a multi-million pound makeover is on the cards for Priory Bay Hotel. Now planning officers have recommended approval of plans to bring it back to life. A planning application to transform the site with tree houses, woodland retreats, a restaurant, farm shop and spa is set to be approved with conditions on Tuesday at the Isle of Wight Council's planning committee meeting. Priory Bay, formerly one of the island's most luxurious and exclusive hotels, is now owned by Aria Resorts, which also owns Rookley Country Park, St Helens Holiday Park and Holiday Cottages in Colwell. The company came under fire after caravan owners at Rookley and St Helens were given notice to quit the sites to make way for their regeneration. The proposals for Priory Bay is for demolition of rear hotel extensions and East Cottage, building a two-storey extension to the hotel conversion, alteration and refurbishments of existing outbuildings to provide 14 hotel suites, a restaurant, bar and spa, provision of up to 56 holiday lodges, 10 tree houses and 12 woodland retreats. It also includes provision of a gym, village barn, farm shop, welcome barn, internal access roads, parking and the relocation of the swimming pool. The plans could create 146 jobs. Planning officers said the proposed development seeks to bring the tourism use of the site back to a high quality and viable offer. The recommendation states Priory Bay Hotel has been closed for business for some years. A lack of investment saw the quality of the tourism offer diminish and some of the building on site fall into disrepair. The principle of the development is therefore considered to be acceptable, resulting in a former tourism site being brought back into use. Visit Isla White has recommended the proposed development as showing a positive outlook to the development of existing tourism products on the island and welcome the year-round availability of the development and the economic impact of year-round employment. However, Island Roads recommended refusal of the application due to the access width at the junction of Eddington Road and issues were raised by the Isle of Wight Council's tree officer. Nettleston and Seaview Parish Council objected due to density, layout and scale and there were 28 letters of objection from the public. Teaming up with firefighters. Students teamed up with firefighters to learn about the benefits of exercise, nutrition and healthy eating. The initiative run by the Island's Fire and Rescue Service is designed to improve teenagers' standard of life across their education, exercise and social environment. Students who take part in the six-week Teen Fire Fit course are nominated for reasons including being disengaged with physical activity or having a long-term medical condition or low self-esteem. Each session included activities unique to the fire service plus healthy eating and practical to cooking tips. Tracy Webb, Community Safety Delivery Manager for the Fire and Rescue Service said we feel we are uniquely placed at the centre of communities to engage with younger people. We can use our professional reputation to encourage participation from those who often don't feel confident enough to join other groups or health programmes. Lead instructor on the course, watch manager Kelvin Wright, said the difference between the students from the first week to the sixth was amazing. Their levels of engagement and self-belief in their own abilities has led them to coming together as a team while achieving individual goals. They should be extremely proud. Ride Academy Principal Joy Ballard was impressed by the students' commitment to the course and said to see them succeed during such a tough course was simply brilliant. Joe's weight loss to inspire others. A mum of three is celebrating losing six stone in less than a year by helping others to do the same. Jo Rees, 40, of St Helens, joined a local Slimming World group in January 2018 and plans to open her own group in the village later this month. She said, 
I didn't have any expectations about what I could achieve or what was possible. All I knew was that I wanted to be smaller. While initially I was not keen on staying in the group, I made many friends who had the same purpose in common. It became such an important part of my week. In May, Joe ran the Needles Cross Country Half Marathon and by July 2018 she had lost five stone in time for her family's summer holiday. Joe said it was here she finally realised how much her weight had held her back. I love jumping in the pool with the kids, something I would not have done previously, and I noticed I had much more room in my plane seat. I feel so much healthier and have so much more energy now. I know how to look after myself properly. Her path to being happy and healthier kick-started in 2014 after an untimely family death. Joe said this taught her that life was short and tomorrow not guaranteed. She made a promise to herself and the family member she would live life to the full with no regrets. From here, Joe continued singing in a local cover band. Undercover resigned from her job in a primary school, set up her own company, Another Way Round, which supports people with dyslexia, ran the Brighton Marathon and wrote a successful memoir book. During this time, her sister had joined Slimming World and lost six and a half stone. She was Joan's inspiration for joining the group. She said her three children and husband had been hugely supportive of her and with their help, she achieved her six stone award in December. Her eight-year-old daughter, Jemima, said, I am so proud of my mum and she inspires me to run and live a healthy life. Jo is excited to begin her role as a Slimming World consultant. Her new group opened at St Helens Primary School at 7.30pm yesterday, Thursday. Have your say on Isle of Wight Roads. Now is the time to share your views on the work of Island Roads over the last year. Have you seen improvements to road surfaces? Are there fewer potholes? What about the state of verges and cut grass? And what do you think of Island Roads customer service? The annual customer survey is due to close today, Friday, but it invites the public to rate Island Road's performance on many aspects of its work. Island Road said the results help it improve its performance. Service Director Stephen Ashman said, We are committed as an organisation to performing to the highest standards and of course we have many mechanisms built into our highways improvement programme to ensure we deliver on that. But hearing the views of residents is also very important to us and we would encourage people to take the time to answer this short survey. The survey can be completed online at www.surveymonkey.co.uk forward slash r forward slash island roads And hard copies are also available in all public libraries, County Hall Reception, the Isle of Wight College and Island Roads Daish Way. Police Marine Unit Saved The Police Marine Unit that patrols the Hampshire and Isle of Wight coast will continue to operate following fears the service may have been cut. Following a review of the unit's operational effectiveness and value for money led by Hampshire and Isle of Wight Police and Crime Commissioner Michael Lane, it was announced current staffing levels would be maintained. Assistant Chief Constable Scott Chilton said, The changes we are making will ensure we deliver a more flexible and focused service. The Marine Unit will continue to support neighbourhood policy on the water and carry out intelligence-led patrols to tackle serious and organised crime. As well as enhancing our marine unit, we will be saving money that can be spent on other operational priorities. This will be achieved by the sale of two large vessels that no longer meet our operational needs. We will instead buy a new craft with improved inland capabilities better able to carry out searches of rivers, lakes and mud to help us locate missing people and evidence from crimes. And now we'd like to say goodbye from Lynn and goodbye from me, Vivian. Stephen. 
Hello, I'm Jan. And we'll be reading the letters and features pages of the County Press for you this week. Starting with a letter from Ted Barrow of Cowes, headlined, Laidlaw Great. When you are well over 80 and have had some health problems, the idea of attending a dozen hour-long sessions of treatment at St Mary's does not sound inviting. Was I that unfit? What are they going to do to me? Was I up to it? Fortunately, I had a clue. The sessions were to be at the Laidlaw, the Centre for Physiotherapy and Related Treatment. The course goes by the name of Postural Stability, Strength, Balance, a well-designed regime which has recently received favourable publicity in one of the national dailies. Five of us with varying ages and backgrounds assembled one Tuesday afternoon last November, met by two cheerful and very experienced practitioners. They soon made it apparent this was a course where what we would get out of it depended on us, but they certainly provided plenty of motivation for us to do well. Last week, the course ended. We would all happily have gone on for many more weeks. All benefited a great deal, each in our own way. It was a good course, but its tremendous success depended on the professionalism and enthusiasm of our two organisers and I will spare their blushes by not naming them. And this one is from B. Harris of Seaview, headed, We Need Proactive Council. The current future planning policy completely works against the requirement of island res residents. We currently have to wait weeks for doctor, hospital and other healthcare services. We have roads which remain an embarrassment, all served by ferry services which are overpriced and unreliable. All of these aspects can be improved with proactive council action. None of these features will be improved by building houses for people who will be unemployed. The island just does not have the year-round employment capacity. At no time have I read correspondence in the county press requesting more housing. The Isle of Wight Council should aim to represent island residents' requirements rather than ruin the island by providing for future holiday homes. I have lived here for more than 80 years and it disgusts me the current lack of drive to improve the current residence environment in favour of those hoped for residents stroke holiday homeowners. The latter market will drop off if building plans continue at the current rate. And on the same subject, Homes for Local People First, a letter from Councillor Carl Love of East Cowes. Only after Bob Seeley sees the number of objections and concerns being expressed by his own constituents does he take the initiative to resist government plans to build large numbers of houses on our island. 50% of our island is in an area of outstanding natural beauty, which means the majority of any new building will be squeezed into existing urban areas. If you Google how many houses are for sale, you will see a staggering 1,755. Ride, for example, has 312, Newport 217 and Cowes 175. The island has a healthy property market. We should therefore only be building properties which enable access to the housing market where we have a social need. We do need some improved social housing and housing which can enable young people and families to purchase their first homes. However, if you take a look around my ward, East Cowes, you will see large numbers of empty properties and purpose-built houses which remain unoccupied. 55 unsold properties at Hawthorne Meadows alone. While they are cheap for those travelling and moving to the Isle of Wight, they are not cheap for our own population. And this is one of the biggest issues we must and have to tackle. We must also protect the outstanding natural beauty of areas such as Norris Castle and Spring Hill. They are areas which have significant historical value 
and their seascape and landscapes are an important feature of full of wildlife and parklands. One day, these areas can be magnificent resources for our communities to enjoy and visit. There are proposals to develop open island green spaces with housing and this is just a destruction of an important habitat and in East Cowes, the distraction of historical cluster of estates is madness. This is not the kind of island which our people want to see being developed. We do need some more housing and particularly social housing. The fact is, we are building housing which are being sold to mainland residents. And while I understand why people would want to move here, we are not actually addressing our own people's needs. Our island's administration is wanting to develop more housing in order to increase revenue from tax. But of course, we need the jobs and infrastructure to go with these band D properties in the first place. Effectively, we are not building for the right reasons. Our island plan has been developed to enable the council to develop its own lands and to deliver Tory policy housing quotas. And um, more comments on housing from Nigel Golding of Ride. The government has told the Isle of Wight Council to build 641 houses per year for the next 15 years, leading to around 10,000 additional homes. On the other hand, figures produced by the Office for National Statistics carefully enhanced to show a steady annual influx of people of pensionable age over that period points to an increase of around 10,000 in the population. So, one house per person? You would think that when bogus figures are being compiled for use in strategic planning, someone would double check the arithmetic. If we use the same 2016 base data as the ONS, but age it naturally, with no artificially distorting influx, the population would in fact decline slightly in the planning period. If Councillor Dave Stewart needs proof the government is trying to con him, he should look at this ONS data he will see, as each of the older age cohorts advance year on year, the number in each cohort mysteriously increases. The government's idea appears to be to dump a large number of older people on the island, with most of those still left of working age employed, at minimum wages in brackets, in care homes. Councillor Stewart should be emphasising the need to maintain the tourism and recreational industries at the heart of the island economy, an economy which will not flourish simply as a giant warehouse for the elderly. And still on the subject of housing, more to housing than meets the eye. And this letter is from Colin Green of Cowes. Discussing with Councillor Stuart Hutchinson the idea of replicating Southampton's partnership in building affordable and social housing modules and why we could not do the same locally in a factory, thereby solving affordability, housing and employment on the island, he told me there were currently 190 plus approved planning developments that had not been started. The Isle of Wight Council's affording housing, affordable housing review shows consecutive administrations since 2012 have failed to meet its agreed targets. Furthermore, the rate of delivery has fallen significantly, from a small surplus in 2011-12, 196 delivered, to only 12% of target in 2015-16, with 284 needed and 35 delivered. The Council has various opportunities to levy fees on developers or impose conditions on delivery. However, I question whether these tools are being used effectively and for the right reasons. Most conditions are imposed under Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act of 1990, 
which contains binding legal obligations upon the owners of land and their successors in title to complete the agreed infrastructure and or investment contributions to provide local amenities. I wonder how many of these obligations have lapsed, been set too low or not been paid. Another such scheme is the Solent Protection Area, the SPA, contributions to offset local development approval. In the controversial 2015 Meadowview development in Cowes and Gurnard, the developers agreed contributions under SPA might be regarded by some as inadequate. Hardly a meaningful contribution when four or five bedroom houses start at £350,000 plus. You then read the small print to find the highest contribution is £15,000, not paid until the project nears completion. Affordable housing has not yet started, with the building project now in its third year. Will it ever be finished? And who will collect? Why then is our council hell-bent on increasing the housing demand when it has failed to deliver and manage current targets? Having planning strategy is worthless if 200 current and approved development applications are mothballed by developers, or worse, they build luxury housing targeted at inward investors and not local need. It used to be, on the Channel Islands, you had two housing markets, local and open. The idea worked to protect affordable property prices for locals, a bit like locals have first refusal at a lower price and outsiders could not purchase at local prices. To those who protest, not in my backyard, you may wish to visit the area of Outstanding Natural Beauty website. The fact is we live on an island of which more than half is strictly protected from overdevelopment legislation to protect the environment. There are only three land corridors covering east of Yarmouth, Cowes to Newport and right to Bembridge available for development. We need housing to preserve local families from moving out and jobs and investment to sustain growth. To say we need 10,000 new homes is pointless if the council has not the ability or control over what is built and when. A cynic might add, the council's decision is based purely on the need to generate revenue through tax. Domestic rates currently contribute £80 million, 50% of the total revenue budget. Business rates, £17 million. Is it not time we had some clear, fog-free vision on the subject, rather than wordy and meaningless documents that won't solve the problem? From Roger Whitby Smith of Ride. Politicians both national and local have led us, or rather misled us, down the garden path regarding housing numbers. I was pleased to see Councillor Price fighting hard against the projected numbers for his ward in the new island plan. When I sat on the development committee, he and one or two others would regularly support the stance I took regarding housing development on the island, especially the annual figure, which was, and is, far too high. It was especially galling when the houses which were built were for private sale and only minimal numbers available for social housing. Not only am I still concerned, but what does it say about our culture to build and build without due consideration of the impact it is having and will continue to have on our countryside and the well-being of those who live close to, close to those builds. In fact, because of the size of the island, most of us will be affected one way or the other. The island is 51% an area of outstanding natural beauty and the special areas within this category should be defended against all unnecessary incursions. If housing is provided beyond our own needs, people will come even though that need could be met elsewhere. It is the duty of our elected representatives to do all they can to preserve the countryside, green spaces, villages and our towns 
from large scale housing developments, no matter what the pressures are to do otherwise. To lose our countryside and green spaces will mean to lose them forever. The Council for the Protection of Rural England has made a very clear case against this excessive envisaged development and should be supported in its campaign. And now a letter from Phil Bunn of Cows, headlined, Tip Hours Need Changing. I just had to write to state how the current opening hours of Linbottom Tip are unacceptable. Opening at 10am means there is little alternative now for working people other than spending their precious weekend time at the tip, deep joy, not to mention the safety implications of having cars queued up blocking the road on a dangerous bend. Surely the council needs to reconsider this situation. And a letter from Liz Bell of Seaview. If it wasn't annoying enough, I couldn't purchase a county press on Friday and I had to get it on Saturday. I was greeted by Emily Pierce's column in The Weekender, Shamima Begum must come home. I did think newspapers should be unbiased, certainly not in this article. Emily was suggesting to us, all tabloid readers, this schoolgirl was our problem and she must be brought home. This may be her personal view, but to tell us county press readers is not good, when in fact a large percentage of us Brits certainly don't think the same. The very next day in the national newspapers, the father of this traitor did admit she shouldn't be brought back. Are you, Emily, prepared to live in the kind of world where we forgive every murderer, rapist, thief, etc? Is she really our problem? Please think carefully before writing about such controversial subjects. And there is an editor's footnote to this. Apologies to Liz and all readers for the county press being late last week. The fog was to blame. However, I make no apology for allowing one of our journalists to express a columnist's opinion on such a controversial subject. And then a letter from Penny Whedon of Ventnor, headlined UFO at Ventnor. Read the Looking Back article about the unidentified low-flying plane 10 years ago in the County Press Weekender from the 8th of the 2nd, I saw one flying over Upper Ventnor when I was walking my dog quite late on February the 17th when it was dark. It was very different to a normal light aircraft. It was an odd shape and flew very slowly and low over the rooftops going back and forth covering the area. Most people thought it was looking for cannabis growers. It came back the next day but nothing more was seen or heard of it. I would love to know what it was doing. And from Chris Patterson of Ride, could someone please tell me why roads are closed for so long? For example, the top end of Ride High Street has been closed for weeks, but there rarely seems to be any workers there. The same with Upton Road. There are a couple of holes and a smell of gas Sometimes there are lights and sometimes the road is closed. But again, rarely anyone working. And I'm sure I could quote lots of places where this happens. Also, it seems to me, whoever closes the road likes to choose the most difficult time. For example, I understand Shanklin Seafront is to be closed for repairs. OK, but why choose the Easter period? This can be a busy time as the schools are on holiday and is the first holiday break when, hopefully, the weather will encourage people along there and local businesses and local business have a chance to recover from the winter. While I realise there are emergencies, the planners of road closures 
also seem to delight in closing roads in the same area, making travel difficult in that area. For example, Ashy Road, Upton Road and now Binstead all have roadworks which make it difficult to choose a route. Please finish one planned area before opening another hole in the vicinity and please repair the roads properly. Am I the only person who is amazed when the repair by the traffic light in West Street, Argyle Street, had a large dip when it was finished? I did report it, but got the reply that it wasn't a problem. So shoddy finishes are apparently allowed. And now the Looking Back column, starting with 100 years ago on March the 1st, 1919. Important islanders met to discuss the National Housing Scheme. Mr Slater, the borough surveyor, spoke of how women should be consulted on the design of new houses for better results. Mayor Whitcher said many homes on the Isle of Wight still resembled caves, long, narrow, dark, damp and dismal. The debate over a fixed link continued in the County Press Letters page. Mr C. Hobart put forward the case for a train ferry. He wrote, I fully agree as to the desirability of bringing the Isle of Wight into direct communications with the mainland. This can be done by means of a train ferry at approximately one-tenth the cost of a tunnel. 75 years ago, what might have resulted in the destruction of a large house was averted by the prompt action of the fire service. Puck House, Fishbourne, had a large thatched roof which had gone up in flames, but crews from Ryde and Newport acted swiftly. One witness wrote to the county press stating the fire service was magnificent and efficient. A home guard adjutant was charged with stealing charitable funds. The man, aged 33, stole four times from a battalion fund and took money directed towards the military fund. It was clear his own personal funds had been low and he said he would pay the money back. And 50 years ago on March the 1st 1969, protesters walked along the footpath to Black Gang Beach to protest its right of way status. More than 80 people, including members of the parish council, the women's institutes and residents, walked between the cliffs and the beach in protest. The council later agreed to maintain the rights of way, order on the land. A strange object in the sky was noticed by multiple county press readers. One wrote in to say, I noticed a very bright object which looked about three feet long. Another said the object appeared to have four or five tails which whirled around. 25 years ago, <clears throat> on March 3rd, 1994, traffic education officials defended their road safety campaign that targeted and angered motorists aged over 60. They maintained the campaign which urged elderly people to make sure they were fit to take the wheel did not discriminate. Mr Barton, council leader, said it was the young people determined the charge, the charge around, to charge around at 50 miles an hour who were the problem. Red Funnel's competition to White Link's super ferries made an impressive first appearance. The £8 million ship, the Red Falcon, attracted hundreds of spectators at its arrival off Cowes. The interior layout and decor marked a radical shift in thinking for cross vote solent vessels. And ten years ago, on February 27, 2009, the first of the trio of controversial ferries heading to the Yarmouth to Lymington route arrived on the island. Natural England continued to disagree with White Link on the effects they could have on the protected salt marsh of the Lymington River. White Link had said it was satisfied there would be no discernible impact. 
and planners ordered a house which did not conform with agreed plans to be demolished. Members of the Isle of Wight Planning Committee ordered a property at Denmark Road in Cowes to be brought down after deciding not to allow retrospective permission. Finally, ten years ago, Wootton Bridge became the first local council on the island to be re-accredited with quality status, a nationally recognised scheme. And now the White Memories column. Headlined Visiting the Island in 1789. Brian Greening tells the story of an intrepid traveller's trip to the Isle of Wight in 1789. The 18th century holidaymaker traversed the island on horseback, visiting various places. Being a local history anorak, I often try to instil upon those who are willing to listen to me, it is a fact that over 200 years ago there was life upon the Isle of Wight. In Newport, local public houses such as the Wheat Chief, the Castle Inn and the Bugle were even then in existence and although we had to wait until around 1814 for our current guild hall to be built, there was a market house and a weekly cattle market in the town. The Isle of Wight was a popular destination too for those who were prepared to risk a two-hour boat trip across from the mainland, and accounts of such visits can be found. In a letter to a Hampshire newspaper in the year 1789, an intrepid traveller gave the following account of his recent visit. He commenced by recalling an earlier visit in 1771, when he was a very young man, and described that among his pleasures then was meeting up and sharing the company of several young ladies whose natural charms and beauty at the time left an impression on him. On his more recent visit, he had returned to stay in the island's capital, and was impressed by the changes that had taken place. He said he was no longer obstructed when walking upon the pavements by a porter pushing a wheelbarrow, who subjected him to insults in a vulgar tongue and had him step off and walk in the road. There appeared to be greater civility and both the Green Dragon in Pyle Street and the Sun Inn in Holyrood Street could not fail to meet with the approbation of strangers. The Bugle Inn was at this time undergoing alterations to add another story that when completed would render it a fine and elegant establishment. Even the more common public houses had a respectable appearance in most places around the town. In order to see more of the island, he hired a horse and set off one morning in the direction of Carisbrook. He took his horse up a steep lane of little more than a mile before the walls of Carisbrook Castle suddenly reared up in front of him. It was by then a tumbled ruin, and he could not but recall the sad fate of the royal inhabitant who had been imprisoned there. After climbing that down, he ascended another, which he found to be Gallowberry, near Roridge. The view from there was superb, with the sea and the mainland showing part of the New Forest and the waters of Lymington and Southampton, and was worthy of the pencil of any artist. The white cliffs of freshwater beckoned him to take a closer look. He was, however, suddenly alerted to his own well-being when his horse stumbled and nearly dismounted him after it had trodden in a deep hole. They had put potholes, they had potholes even then. While horses were able to care with care to travel the narrow lanes, they could be a danger to wagons that might find themselves <coughs> half a wheel deep in ruts. Soon he came to an angle in the road before coming upon some gravel pits. As the ground rose before him, he could see below him a village and a mansion and several cottages. Continuing on the side of, the, of a hill for about half a mile, he commenced descending and came upon a small church and from a shepherd boy learnt he had arrived at Brook. Another steep ascent followed, and he thought carriages would find it difficult to pass any other road traffic, again the road being in bad disrepair. At the top of this down, the view below was one of fields of corn, pastures, interspersed with farm cottages and fields of cattle and sheep. In the distance 
he saw the town of Yarmouth, with ships passing and at anchor. Hurst Castle, the Bay of Christchurch, and the town of Lymington received additional lustre from the rays of the sun. Being now ready for refreshment, he stopped at Freshwater Gate, where there was a public house where he was able to purchase a fine plate of fish and meat and beer that was exceedingly good. With the liquor, he found that too much of it, unless diluted with water, was far too strong. It is a wonderful description of our island when it was administered by succeeding members of the Holmes family who lived at Westover and who had the power to nominate or have a major say in who our six members of Parliament were to be, as well as those who sat as members of Newport's Borough Council, a group of Tories even then who put their own interests first and ignored the views of the then labouring classes. Some people might think that some things never change, but I could not possibly say that. And now the My View column, the first of which is written by Rebecca Roncaroni and is headlined So Easy to Pass Judgment on the Young. Recently, there has been a spate of incidents involving young people. Our local media, as well as wider social media, was all over it. Anyone reading the news at the time could be forgiven for thinking we were being overrun and overtaken by huge gangs of criminal, dangerous, marauding youths hell-bent on terrorising decent local people. Feelings ran high, especially on social media. The whole thing became disturbing. It seemed many people were too ready to believe the hyperbole, a lot of it created online in various local groups without checking the facts. Hidden in various reports was a senior policeman who had stated that it was a small group of young people with maybe about eight hangers-on. Or, as it turned out, a brief one-boy crime wave who was arrested and charged within a few days. No doubt he had his acolytes cheering him on until it got a bit serious and they melted away. Meanwhile, a whole generation was being gleefully demonised online, accused of being vermin who were turning Newport into a ghetto, mainly by adults recalling their teenage days. They were all angels, obviously, and putting forward suggestions on how to deal with the youth of today. The following are just a few of these suggestions on how to deal with these disrespectful young pups that were posted online in local community groups and in the comments sections of our local media. Water cannon, guards with snipers, borstal, taser, castration, crucifixion, shooting, birching, sending in dogs, tarring, beating, electrocution, a good kicking, the stocks, burn them, and the contributors were all happily geeing each other on in their keyboard activism against this scourge. The anger and spite and let's call it out for what it is, hate, in the expressed desire to institutionalise torture, inflict pain, damage and even death to these errant youngsters was disturbing. Extremely. The violence, cruelty and dehumanisation of the young was breathtaking. And the question in my mind was, are these advocates for torturing teenagers seriously thinking they are in some kind of moral high ground with this malice? Closely followed by another, isn't it hugely hypocritical that people are proposing these acts of violence towards young people whose crimes have come nowhere near what the punishments advocated for them by those who know better? One has to wonder what kind of upbringing the proponents of such severe consequence had for them to believe violence is the answer. I also wonder how these people would react if it had been the young people making these hideous threats to the older generation. The answer is, there would be an uproar, and God only knows what torture suggested to deal with it. Before older generations pass judgement on younger generations, maybe they should ensure they are the ones setting a good example for our young people to follow. And, and for an article by Malcolm Mime in the My View column, 
uh, and heading is good time for a centrist candidate. The recent formation of the independent group at Westminster has gotten me rather excited. At last there could be a shake-up in British politics and at last I might have a party I'm actually prepared to vote for. However, even if this group do go on to form a proper political party that sits firmly in the centre of British politics and offers much needed balance away from the extreme left of Corbyn and Labour Party, led Labour Party, and the far right May led Tories, it would be a huge challenge for them to win on the island. Since the early 1920s, the Isle of Wight has pretty much been a Tory safe seat, and it is often said that if a monkey stood as the Conservative candidate at a general election on the island, it would win. All a sitting Tory MP has to do over here to get re-elected is A. Keep their nose clean and B. Do absolutely nothing. There is no C. In the early 1970s, the long-standing Tory MP Mark Woodnut broke both the golden rules. Firstly, by dirtying his hooter, by being actively involved in the Bembridge Harbour scandal, and secondly, pushing through an Act of Parliament that effectively banned music festivals on the island. It resulted in him losing his seat to Liberal Steve Ross in the election held in February 1974. If only there had been a monkey available to the Tories. Andrew Turner successfully kept the seat for the Tories for 16 years by keeping his head down and doing nothing. But when he made the mistake of voicing his, or was it God's, opinion on homosexuality, he was quickly whisked away and replaced by Bob Bubbles Seeley. The Tories had learnt their lesson from 1974. Since his election nearly two years ago, Bubbles has done a great job of sticking to the golden rules. He hasn't tried to buy any harbours from the council at less than market value and he has done nothing. And I do mean absolutely nothing whatsoever. So the seat here should be his for as long as he wants it. What the triumph of Steve Ross proved, and also the triumph of Liberal Democrat Peter Brand in 1997, is there are a number of voters on the island whose politics sit in the centre. So a good strong candidate for the independent group on the island could do very well. The Liberal Democratic Party on the island has pretty much disappeared off the political map, mainly due to very poor candidate choice. But in recent years, both Labour and the Greens have been attracting new voters. So a centralist independent would have to try and win back voters from those two left-wing parties as well as winning, winning those who have quite possibly been reluctant Tory voters in recent elections. I look forward to developments. And now some news of local events, um, the first of which takes place in the central area of the island, um, with an article headlined, Tokens Add Up for Jigsaw. The winners of ASDA's Green Token Scheme the Jigsaw family support were given their winners by a cheque last week. The scheme named Chosen by You, Given by Us, allows ASDA shoppers to choose one of the three charities they would like to see ASDA support. All charities are given the chance to nominate themselves before ASDA colleagues choose their top three. 
The winner receives £500 and the runners-up get £200 each. Jigsaw Family Support, who help children going through a family separation, will receive the £500. While Bodster Equine Assisted Learning and the Isle of Wight Asthma Society Swim Group both got £200. And in the uh, local area of the South area news, dozens of people threw themselves into the sea at Shanklin to raise money for the homeless. The group of hardy swimmers took to the beach at sunset to raise money for the good cause. The crowd ran into the sea and braved three minutes in the icy cold water. And again in the central area, we have a donation for drums. The Vectus Corps of Drums will be buying new instruments, thanks to a £500 donation by Rob Kingswell Heavy Hollies Limited. Mr Kingswell, who used to be in a band himself, generously donated the money to support the youth band. A spokesperson for Vectus Corps of Drums said the band was extremely grateful for the donation and would like to thank Mr Kingswell. A cheque was presented during a band practice evening attended by Mr and Mrs Kingswell. The band is now in its 27th year and can be seen taking part in various events across the island. For more information on joining or booking the band, visit their Facebook page. Or call the bandmaster Steve Thompson on 822 431. And Shanklin and District History Society will be meeting on Thursday at 7.25 at the Falcon Cross Hall in Shanklin, when Nigel Offer will give a talk on the history of the Austin Seven. Doors open at 7pm for members and for visitors, who will be very welcome at 7.15. And that's all we have time for this week, so it's goodbye from me, Stephen. And goodbye from Jan. Goodbye. This is the BBC. This is In Touch, the magazine programme for people like me who are blind or partially sighted. I'm Peter White. Thanks for downloading this week's edition. Good evening. Tonight, a simpler way to book help for your train journey. Well, that's the claim. We've been trying it out. And a longer journey for 11-year-old Hester off to Ethiopia to find out just how different life there is for blind pupils. And the in-touch columnist who wishes school life had been different for him when he lost his sight at the age of 16. But first, Virgin Trains announced today a new way for visually impaired passengers to book assistance for their rail journeys. It involves using voice commands through Alexa-enabled devices. Now, until now, to book your assistance, you'd either have to fill in an online form or request it via a call centre. So, how well does this work? Regular train user Emma Tracy has been trying it out for us. Book Journey Care. I found the 12.58pm from Haymarket to Carlisle on 13th of March. Is this the journey you'd like help with? Yes. Great. I just need to ask a few questions to arrange your assistance. So we can help you when you arrive at Haymarket. Can you tell us how are you getting to Haymarket? By taxi. So we can help you continue your journey. Can you tell us how are you travelling onward from Carlisle? By taxi. Do you have an assistance dog? No. As this is your first time booking Journey Care, I need some extra information from you. I've just sent some really easy instructions to your Alexa app. Take a look, and then when you're finished, relaunch Virgin Trains. Ask to book Journey Care, and I'll sort it for you. Ah, oh, okay. So I've had to be really determined to get that booked and I'm not even sure I got the train that I was supposed to get. But anyway, I will go and I will come back to you once I have filled in whatever they want to on the Alexa app. So, the ever helpful Alexa doing her very best to be of service. But it seems it wasn't quite so straightforward as just talking to the device. It directed Emma back to her smartphone. In the end, though, she was able to make a request for assistance. Do you need any help with your luggage on this trip? 
No. Okay, got it. I've sent those details onto the team. They will be in touch shortly confirming your journey care booking. Emma Tracy. Well, to tell us more about it, I've been talking to Virgin's inclusion lead, Vic Whitehouse. She began by telling me why they developed it. So it was a natural progression for us, Peter. Uh, We wanted to explore what else we could do around Alexa and the journey care uh, voice activated booking assistance was was just a perfect fit really. Did you suspect that some visually impaired people were having problems with booking journey care? Um, I think journey care for anyone booking it you know it, it depends what needs the customers got and and to test this out we actually did a trial so we've got an inclusion panel that we run at Virgin Trains and we invited members of that inclusion panel of which two customers involved in that panel have visual impairment and ask them to come along and and test Alexa's skill set out with us. Um, And what did those tests tell you basically about how well this worked? I mean presumably you did work well or you wouldn't be introducing it so what what was the evidence from the trials? When we ran the trials we we recognised that one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we got from customers with visual impairments is the ease of booking in terms of it reduced the amount of time that it actually took to book journey care. So ordinarily they'd have had to have called a call centre and we had had feedback about call centre times being quite long um, because there's a form that you have to go through. So when you set up your, your profile... Where is that information stored? So that information is held in the Virgin Train skill on Alexa and that's actually kept in there so it enables customers that are rebooking journey care in the future uh, to book the journey care quicker. But there is an option to opt out of actually the skill holding your data as well. So if people don't want the skill to hold the data, obviously that will make the booking time a little bit longer because they'll have to say it all again but there is the opt-out option there. Vic Whitehouse, Virgin Trains lead on inclusion. And by the way, if using something like Alexa isn't what you'd normally do, you can still phone or book online. So what about the other train companies? What are they up to? Lee Kumatat has more details about that. Lee? Well, our relentless researcher, Lucy Edwards, contacted every rail company in England and Scotland. The Stagecoach Group, which jointly runs East Midlands and Virgin Trains West Coast Line, say they will be monitoring the project with Alexa and Journeycare closely. Eurostar does have a voice assistant skill which allows you to check your train status and search for the cheapest fare but at this point doesn't let you book your ticket or your assistance. TransPennine Express, Heathrow Express and Scott Rail are all looking at using voice assistants like Google Home or the Apple HomePod in the future. You can plan a journey using the National Rail skill on Alexa, but can't book your assistance. The others either didn't respond or have no plans at present. But the Rail Delivery Group did tell us they have developed a smartphone app for booking help with your rail journeys, which is being trialled at the moment. It will, they say, allow customers to set up a personal profile and give staff live updates so they can provide a better service and accommodate short notice requests. They confirmed that blind and visually impaired people are taking part in the trial and the app is planned for release in the autumn. Lee Kumatat, thank you very much indeed and do tell us how you get on if you use the Virgin system. Details of how to get in touch with us at the end of the programme. Now, 11-year-old Hester is off on a journey as well, rather beyond the range of travel assistance. She's going to Ethiopia to take part in a run to raise funds for the Michaeli School for Blind Pupils in the district of Tigray. She'll also be attending lessons at the school to find out more about how her counterpart's experiences differ from hers. But when she joined me from her own school, King Edwards, in Bath, she told me how she'd become interested in Ethiopia. 
Well, it all started when it was a charity in my primary school and we had to hang up clothes on a washing line and I was quite interested in the charity. So that's when I started getting involved. And my um, friend's mother is, I think it's a chairman of the charity, so that also helped with the connection. Because clothes clearly are scarce. I mean, what do you know already about uh, what it's like for pupils in Ethiopia? I know that um, their education is quite basic and they don't really have all the equipment that I have and I'm going to give them all of the things that they need. And also it's not just their lessons, it's their social life and the grounds around them that also are quite sort of, they need developing. So in a way you, you feel as if you've been quite lucky in a way, you want to pass it on. Yeah, I, I've been quite lucky with my education. I've basically got everything I need for an independent school life and I want to give them that opportunity to be independent. Are you nervous about this at all? Uh, it's going to be quite a big step going to Ethiopia, but it will be very exciting. And do you have any idea what, you know, what a lesson would be like in it? Because you're going to be going into classes. I just wondered if you've got any idea of um, how different that might be from what happens at King Edward's. Uh, no, I'm not really sure what's going to happen, so I think we're going to learn. So it'll be interesting to find out what it's like. Now, you've got a bit of a history of fundraising, haven't you? This isn't your first venture by any means. Uh, and I think last year you undertook 100 sports in 100 days to raise money for your visually impaired skiing uh, team. Yeah, that's right. It was quite intense, but a very fun summer. Give me some uh, names. What, what kind of sports did you do? Oh, uh, from indoor skydiving to unicycling to archery. I didn't much like that one. Um, <laughs> gave me a mask. I couldn't see anything. Um, yeah, I did a huge range of sports and it was very fun. I met some incredible people along the way. Must have been pretty exhausting. 100 sports in 100 days. My knees haven't been the same since. <laughs> now, um, would you be willing, This is we're throwing this at you, haven't even warned you, what we'd love is if you'd be willing to maybe do a few recordings for us while you're there with the right amount of help about your experiences? Oh, yeah, that, I could do that, yeah, sure. <laughs> you're very confident. <laughs> so you reckon you could do that? Yes, I think so, um, yeah, <laughs> What are you most looking forward to? I'm just looking forward to sort of experiencing what they experience and building on that to make their education more accessible and fun and, yeah, just getting the experience. Now, you, you've talked about sports. Um, just tell us a bit about the, the run. Where, where is that and who will you run with? That's in Addis Ababa in the middle of Ethiopia and it's the women's first run and I'm doing it with my ski guide, Charlotte Evans, who coaches me. In the past, she won a gold medal with her previous um, VI athlete called Kelly Gallagher. Um, and that was quite a big achievement for them both. And how long is your, your run? How tough a run is it? Oh, it's 5k, so um, quite a big sort of run, but... It'll be OK. Have you run 5k before? I would have thought with 100 sports in 100 days, that, that will be nothing for you. Yeah, I do the park run every week, so... Mm. Mm. Of course, Ethiopia is at, at, at quite a height, isn't it? Is that Have you been warned about that? Yes, I. Uh, it's good and bad because uh, altitude, it'll be quite hard for the run. But um, at least I didn't have to have the malaria and yellow fever tablets. <laughs> uh, why? Have you already had them? Yeah, I've already had my jabs. <laughs> And I gather there are some quite um, steep and tricky hills as well. Yeah, it's going to be up and down, up and down, stumble trip along the way. <laughs> well, very good luck and thank you very much for joining us. Well, we certainly hope to be hearing more from Hester about her trip later on. Certainly sounds as if she is thriving at her mainstream school in Bath. But a few weeks ago, we heard on the programme how a motion had been introduced into the Scottish Parliament which sought to question the presumption that mainstream education was always the best option for disabled pupils. The interview with the MP who introduced it prompted this personal response from Mike Lambert. When I was 16, I lost my sight in an accident. Back in 1972, the idea that, with support... I could continue at my local school wasn't even considered. Part of the problem 
was I already attended a segregated school, where all the pupils were non-disabled. None of us had a clue about disability or what it might take to include someone with sight loss. My teachers and parents were relieved and grateful to receive the glossy brochure from the special school. Thank God such centres of expertise even existed where I could carry on my education. And so, without further ado, I was dispatched to a school for the blind far from my home in London. But what happened over the next three years set me wondering about the desirability of educating disabled and non-disabled children in separate institutions. Admittedly, my special school gave me the grades I needed for university. But it was academic success at a very high price in terms of my social and emotional well-being. For one thing, losing my sight then immediately being sent away to a special school created a painful sense of isolation. Just when I needed them most, I was separated from my family and community and slowly but surely lost touch with my old friends. Meanwhile, what I was finding out about my new school did nothing to help me adjust to the social and emotional consequences of sight loss. Back then, the level of institutionalisation was alarming. Many of its 90 boys had attended the same special schools since kindergarten. No wonder they developed a shared culture which I found impenetrable and cut off from teenage life as I knew it. When my parents came to visit, I hoped they wouldn't notice the boys aimlessly rocking from side to side and the shocking standards of hygiene demonstrated by some of my new classmates. And just at a time when I was working out what it meant to be blind in a sighted world, these were some of the role models that surrounded me. Following university, I trained as a teacher and spent most of my career coordinating support for disabled youngsters studying at their local mainstream college. I saw how, with the right resources, visually impaired students could succeed on vocational and academic courses across the curriculum. And I know there's no overwhelming practical reason why blind or visually impaired children need to attend special schools. Hardly a day goes by when I'm not confronted by strangers made uncomfortable or anxious by my disability. It's nobody's fault. Most likely, I'm the first blind person they've ever had dealings with. Almost as surprising are those people I encounter who aren't the least bit phased by my situation. And often this turns out to be because they had some early positive experience of disability or difference, either within their family or a school that had an inclusive ethos. How could it be otherwise? You can't just separate people throughout their formative years, then expect them to get along and negotiate their differences as adults. And, if I'm right, then mustn't there be a connection between the special school system and our society's failure to adequately include disabled people in the workplace and other adult settings? Inclusive education is a human right. That's the view of the United Nations in its Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Unfortunately, although the UK is a signatory of this UN Convention, our government maintains a legal reservation against inclusive education. The best we have is a presumption of mainstream, and in practice this presumption is so shot through with caveats and legal loopholes that parents find it extremely difficult to insist on a mainstream placement. The Scottish Parliament has approved Liz Smith's motion and there'll now be an official review into how this presumption is being implemented. Hopefully, those conducting this review will see the advantages of a system where 
disabled and non-disabled children learn about the world and one another in the same properly resourced classrooms. Mike Lambert, and I'll be very surprised if we don't have a few reactions to that. If you want to react to anything in the programme, you can email us at intouch at bbc.co.uk or you can go to the Contact Us link on our website. That's www.bbc.co.uk forward slash intouch. Or you can leave us a message on 0161 836 1338 1338. Do please Leave us a number if you'd like us to get back to you. We can't promise, but we'll do our very best. What's in next week's programme? Well, even we're not sure yet. But one thing we can promise you, that debate about whether blind actors should always get first dibs when it comes to playing blind parts. In one corner, stand-up comedian Chris McCausland. In the other, actor Chloe Clark. Do join us for that. From me, Peter White, producer Lee Kumatat and the team, goodbye. Please find below a list of known footway obstructions for works including scaffolding, hoarding, also details of skips, cranes and cherry pickers. We are unable to include end dates as many are extended on a week-by-week basis. Cows area, current scaffolds. 93 High Street Cows, scaffold up within hoarding. The White Hart Inn, Dover Road, East Cows. Pier View Hotel, Terminus Road, Cows. The Public Conveniences, The Parade, Cows. Current Hoardings, 93 High Street, Cows. The Public Conveniences, The Parade, Cows. Current skips, seven Magdalen Crescent cows and 42 Birmingham Road cows. Pending skips, 19 Mill Hill Road cows and 66 Granville Road cows. Newport area, current scaffolds, the Wheatsheaf Hotel, St Thomas's Square, Newport. Clare's Accessories, 41 High Street, Newport. Barnett's, 73 High Street, Newport. 15 Cypress Road, Newport. Ride area. Current scaffolds. Gardener's Cottage, Upper Green Road, St Helens. 91 to 92 High Street, Ride. Coburg's Nightclub, Union Street, Ride. Headshot, 9 Cross Street Ride 21 The Strand Ride Current Skips Carita Steen Road Sea View Pending Skips 4 Sherborne Avenue Ride Building Materials and Hoarding Car Park Brooks Road Bembridge Sandown and Shanklin area Current scaffolds, the Toymaster, 103 High Street, Sandown, Wilmar, Dawkin and the Maper Cottages, Church Street, New Church, Trueville Hotel, 10 to 16 Esplanade, Sandown, the Ocean Hotel Townhouses, High Street, Sandown, Co-op Food Store, 63 to 67 High Street, Sandown, Serenity, 83A High Street Sandown Bar 64 High Street Shanklin 5 Station Road Sandown Pending Scaffolds 5 Palmerston Road Shanklin 2 Albion Road Sandown 101 High Street Shanklin Current Skips Co-op Store, 63-67 to 67 High Street, Sandown. St Peter's, Hill Street, Sandown. 9 Pier Road, Sandown. Current Hoardings, Premier Inn, 1-9 to 9 Esplanade, Sandown. Junction of St Boniface Road and Arthur's Hill, Shanklin. Ventnor Area. Current Scaffolds, Corner of Trinity Road and Madeira Road, Ventnor. 
1 Boniface Road and into Trinity Road, Ventnor. The Blenheim, 9 High Street, Ventnor. Pending scaffolds, Flat 1, 1 Marlborough Road, Ventnor. Current skips, Seascape, St Catherine's Road, Knighton. West White Area, Current Scaffolds, Old School, Fine Lane, Shorewell. Vectus House, Ward Road, Totland. Current Hoarding, Skip and Building Materials, End of Witherfields, Cul-de-Sac, Shellfleet. Vehicle Crossings Under Construction. New Wolverton Farm, Doctors Lane, Shorewell. 14 Paddock Close, Gods Hill. 18 Moorview, Gods Hill. 10 Meaders Road, Ride. Carisbrook College Entrance, Mountbatten Drive, Newport. 53 Wyatt's Lane, Northwood. 24 St Michael's Avenue, Ride. 25 Ratcliffe Avenue, Ride. 9 Alfred Road Lake, 133 West Hill Road, Ride.